60 Great Ghost Stories, read by H. Washington Sawyer. Tonight's story, The Lake, by Ray Bradbury. They cut the sky down to my size and threw it over the Michigan lake, put some kids yelling on yellow sand with bouncing balls, a gull or two, a criticizing parent, and me breaking out of a wet wave and finding this world bleary and moist. I ran up on the beach. Mama swabbed me with a furry towel. Stand there and dry, she said. I stood there and watched the sun take away the water beads on my arms. I replaced them with goose pimples. My, there's a wind, said Mama. Put on your sweater. Wait till I catch my goose pumps, I said. Harold, said Mama. I inserted me into my sweater and watched the waves come up and fall down on the beach, but not clumsily, on purpose, with a green sort of elegance. Even a drunken man could not collapse with such elegance as those waves. It was September in the last days when things were getting sad for no reason. The beach was so long and lonely, with only about six people on it. The kids quit bouncing the ball because somehow the wind made them sad too, whistling the way it did. And they sat down and felt autumn come along the long beach. All the hot dog places were boarded up with strips of golden planking, sealing in all the mustard, onion, meat odors of the long, joyful summer. It was like nailing summer into a series of coffins. One by one, the places slammed their covers down, padlocked their doors, and the wind came and touched the sand, blowing away all of the million footprints of July and August. It got so that now, in September, there was nothing but the mark of my rubber tennis shoes and Donald and Delau Scabold's feet and their father down by the water curve. Sand blew up in curtains on the sidewalks and the merry-go-round was hidden with canvas, all the horses frozen in mid-air on their brass poles, showing teeth galloping on, with only the wind for music slipping through canvas. I stood there. Everyone else was in school. I was not. Tomorrow, I would be on my way westward across the United States on a train. Mom and I had come to the beach for one last brief moment. There was something about the loneliness that made me want to get away by myself. Mama, I want to run up the beach a ways, I said. All right. But hurry back, and don't go near the water. I ran. Sand spun under me, and the wind lifted me. You know how it is, running, arms out so you feel veins from your fingers caused by wind, like wings. Mama withdrew into the distance, sitting. Soon she was only a brown speck, and I was all alone. Being alone is a newness to a twelve-year-old child. He is so used to people around. The only way he can be alone is in his mind. That's why children imagine such fantastic things. There are so many real people around telling children what and how to do that a boy has to run off down a beach, even if it's only in his mind, to get by himself in his own world with his own miniature values. So now I was really alone. I went down to the water and let it cool up to my stomach. Always before, with the crowd, I hadn't dared to look, but now, sawing a man in half, a magician, water is like that. It feels as if you were sawed in half and part of you, sugar, is dissolving away. Cool water and once in a while a very elegantly stumbling wave that fell with a flourish of lace. 
I called her name. A dozen times I called it. Tally! Tally! Oh, Tally! Funny, but you really expect answers when you're calling. When you are young, you feel that whatever you may think can be real. And sometimes, maybe, that is not so wrong. I thought of Tally, swimming out into the water last May, with her pigtails trailing, blonde. She went laughing, and the sun was on her small twelve-year-old shoulders. I thought of the water settling quiet, of the lifeguard leaping into it, of Tally's mother screaming, and how Tally never came out. The lifeguard tried to persuade her to come out, but she did not. He came back with only bits of water weed in his big knuckled fingers, and Tally was gone. She would not sit across from me at school any longer or chase indoor balls on the brick street on summer nights. She had gone too far out, and the lake would not let her come back in. And now... In the lonely autumn, when the sky was huge, and the water was huge, and the beach was so very long, I had come down for the last time, alone. I called her name over and over, Tally, oh, Tally. The wind blew so very softly over my ears, the way wind blows over the mouth of seashells and sets them whispering. The water rose and embraced my chest and then to my knees, up and down, one way and another, sucking under my heels. Tally, come back! Oh, Tally! I was only twelve, but I know how much I loved her. It was that love that comes before all significance of body and morals. It was that love that is no more bad than wind and sea and sand lying side by side forever. It was made of all the warm, long days together at the beach and the humming, quiet days of droning education at the school. All the long autumn days of the years past when I had carried her books home from school. Tally! I called her name for the last time. I shivered. I felt water on my face and did not know how it got there. The waves had not splashed me there. My own tide was coming in, and I drowned in it. Turning, I retreated to the land and stood there for half an hour, hoping for one glimpse, one sign, one little bit of tally to remember. Then, in a sort of symbol, I knelt and built a castle of sand, shaping it fine and building it up as Tally and I had often built them, so many of them. But this time, I only built half of it. Then I got up. Tally, if you hear me, come in and build the rest. I began to walk off toward the faraway speck that was Mama. The water came in and blended the sea castle circle by circle, mashing it down little by little into the original smoothness. I could not help but think that there were no castles in life that one builds that some wave does not spread down into the old, old formlessness. Silently, I walked up the beach. Far away, a merry-go-round jangled faintly, but it was only the wind. I went away on the train the next day. Across the cornlands of Illinois, a train has a poor memory. It soon puts all behind it. It forgets the rivers of childhood, the bridges, the lakes, the valleys, the cottages, the pains and joys. It spreads them out behind, and they drop back of a horizon. I lengthened my bones, put flesh on them, changed my young mind for an older one, threw away clothes as they no longer fitted, 
shifted from grammar to high school to college books to law books. And then there was a young woman in Sacramento. There was a preacher. There were words and kisses. I continued with my law study. By the time I was 22, I had almost forgotten what the East was like. Margaret suggested that our delayed honeymoon trip be taken back in that direction. A train works both ways, like a memory. It brings rushing back all those things you left behind so many years before. Lake Bluff, population 10,000, came up over the sky. Margaret looked so handsome in her fine new clothes. She kept watching me as I watched my old world gather me back into its living. Her strong white hands held onto mine as the train slid into Bluff Station and our baggage was escorted out. So many years, and the things they do to people's faces and bodies. When we walked through the town, arm in arm, I saw no one I recognized. There were faces with echoes in them, echoes of hikes on ravine trails, faces with small laughter in them from closed grammar schools and swinging on metal-linked swings and going up and down on teeter-totters. But I didn't speak. I just walked and looked and filled up inside with all those memories, like leaves stacked for burning in autumn. Our days were happy there, two weeks in all, revisiting all the places together. I thought I loved Margaret very well. At least, I thought I did. It was on one of these last days that we walked down by the shore. It was not quite as late in the year as that day so many years before, but the first evidences of desertion were coming upon the beach. The people were thinning out. Several of the hot dog places had been shuttered and nailed, and the wind, as always, had been waiting there to sing for us. I almost saw Mama sitting on the sand as she used to sit. I had that feeling again of wanting to be alone, but I could not force myself to say it to Margaret. I only held on to her and waited. It got late in the day. Most of the children had gone home, and only a few men and women remained basking in the windy sun. The lifeguard boat pulled up on the shore. The lifeguard stepped out of it, slowly, with something in his arms. I froze there. I held my breath and I felt small, only twelve years old, very little, very infinitesimal and afraid. The wind howled. I could not see Margaret. I could see only the beach, the lifeguard slowly emerging from his boat with a gray sack in his hands, not very heavy, and his face almost as gray and lined. Stay here, Margaret, I said. I don't know why I said it. But why? Just stay here, that's all. I walked slowly down the sand to where the lifeguard stood. He looked at me. What is it? I asked. The lifeguard kept looking at me for a long time, and he couldn't speak. He put the gray sack down on the sand. The water whispered wet up around it and went back. What is it? I insisted. She's dead, said the lifeguard quietly. I waited. Funny, he said softly. Funniest thing I ever saw. She's been dead a long time. I repeated his words. A long time? Ten years, I'd say. There hasn't been any children drowned here this year. There were twelve children drowned here since 1933 but we recovered all their bodies before a few hours had passed. All except one, I remember. This body here. Why, it must be ten years in the water. It's not pleasant. Open it, I said. I don't know why I said it. 
The wind was louder. He fumbled with the sack. The way I know it's a little girl is because she's still wearing a locket. There's nothing much else to tell by. Hurry, man, open it, I cried. I better not do that, he said. Then maybe he saw the way my face must have looked. She was such a little girl. He opened it only part way. That was enough. The beach was deserted. There was only the sky and the wind and the water and the autumn coming on lonely. I looked down at her there. I said something over and over. The lifeguard looked at me. Where did you find her? I asked. Down the beach in the shallow water. Down that way. It's a long, long time for her, ain't it? I shook my head. Yes, it is. Oh, God. Yes, it is. I thought people grow. I have grown, but she has not changed. She is still small. She is still young. Death does not permit growth or change. She still has golden hair. She will be forever young, and I will love her forever. Oh God, I will love her forever. The lifeguard tied up the sack again. Down the beach, a few moments later, I walked by myself. I found something I didn't really expect. This was where the lifeguard found her body, I said to myself. There, at the water's edge, lay a sand castle, only half built. Just like Tally and I used to make them, she half and I half. I looked at it. This is where they found Tally. I knelt beside the sand castle and saw the little prince of feet coming in from the lake and going back out to the lake again and not returning ever. Then I knew. I'll help you to finish it, I said. I did. I built the rest of it up very slowly, and then I rose and turned away and walked off, so as not to watch it crumble in the waves as all things crumble. I walked back up the beach to where a strange woman named Margaret waited for me, smiling. 